Now let's prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. We've got a general polynomial with complex coefficients. And the first thing, and uh, n is greater than 0, so it's really it's non-constant. The first thing is, and this is where the other piece of topology comes in, is if we look at the behavior of that on the complex plane, p of 0 is just going to be some complex number a a naught. It's going to have some value there at the origin. And then what happens if we go way, way far out? If the magnitude of z goes to infinity, no matter what direction we're going in, if the magnitude of z goes to infinity, pretty pretty clear, I hope, and I, I don't want to write out the, the gory details. They're not too gory, but I, I want to gloss over certain points. Um, this is going to dominate. That's going to be the dominant term. And that's going to go to magnitude infinity as well. There's a very convenient way to say that. It's simply that the limit as z goes to infinity, and this really means in any direction, it's a pretty powerful statement to make, but it's true, is infinity, which means that all those values are getting big in magnitude, and maybe they're doing crazy stuff in terms of direction. The key thing is that the magnitude of this guy gets very, very big, very, very far away from the origin. So if we want to look at where the minimum of the magnitude of p of z is achieved, or is it ever achieved? Okay, um, maybe there's lots of functions that don't have a minimum, but this is a continuous function, and when I go very, very far out, it's not going to a minimum, that's for sure. It's getting huge, it's going to infinity. And so very basic fact about maxima and minima, this is the topology coming in again, is that that minimum will be achieved. And it's going to happen on some disk. Uh, of radius r, okay? So that you, eventually you get big enough out so that outside that disk you know the values are just huge and so somewhere in here is the minimum and so let's call that z sub zero okay and so what is that specifically to be precise um, z naught is such that p of z naught magnitude of that is the minimum value of the magnitude of p of c over the whole complex plane. Now, what should that be? What are we trying to prove about p, remember? We're trying to prove it has a zero. Um, and so this minimum should be zero. And this is a very, very common thing, is that it's actually often easier, and that this actually, this, here we're doing it in a theoretical way, but it's often, often easier to do a minimization problem, to solve a minimization problem than an equation, than solving an equation. And this is a, an end run around solving equations. It's incredibly common, um, both practically and theoretically. Okay, so, and let's let A be that minimum value. Okay, um, and so we're going to assume, we're going to do a little proof by contradiction, we're going to assume that that is bigger than zero. Okay, um, that the magnitude, oh sorry, let's, let's let A be without the magnitude. There we go. And we're, the assumption is that magnitude is bigger than zero. And um, <clears throat> we're going to look for a contradiction. And remember what's special about it is that this is supposed to be the smallest value you can ever get for the magnitude of P and we're assuming it's greater than zero. Okay, so um, let's do some reductions here. This is where I differ a little bit from the, the way the Wikipedia proof is, because I just think they kind of miss an opportunity to make it, to emphasize how simple it is sort of from now on. Um, what we're going to do, remember this picture, we've got this special point z sub zero, z naught, and that's where the minimum is. You know what? I can translate. I can slide it over. 
I can just change a variable by taking z minus z naught everywhere. And I could write it out, and that's the way um, you'll often see it, like in the Wikipedia article. But you know what? I'm just going to redefine. I'm just going to say assume by saying, let's suppose we've already translated it and just relabeled everything that z naught equals 0. If we can do that special case, then we can do the case where we just shift it over. Okay? So what does that mean? P of z is going to have a very special form. Uh, it's going to be a. A is still that p of zero, p of p of z naught. So now p is just p of zero. Okay. Plus what? Well, plus other stuff. And it might be most likely it's going to be a plus c one z plus c two z squared plus etc. Um, but we've got to be aware of the possibility, and we want to keep track of it kind of carefully, that some of the intervening coefficients between the constant term and some higher power are zero. And so the CK is supposed to be the first non-zero coefficient. Okay. And um, I'm going to abbreviate this. A very common abbreviation is this is stuff of order z to the k plus 1, which means it's just uh, constants times z to the k plus 1 plus higher order terms. And the reason I'm just shoving this into under this rug here is that I'm not going to care about it. I'm not going to need to care about it. I'm just going to make an uh, assertion very quickly that this can be ignored. Okay. I'm also going to do another simplification. Let's divide by CK. Okay. That's a non-zero number. I can multiply or divide by that, and um, I'm not going to change whether p has a zero or not. That's not going to be cheating. Okay. And again, I'm not going to come up with a new polynomial name. I'm just going to say, oh, you know what? And I'm not going to change a. I'm just reducing it to the case where that guy is one. So here's what I'm basically saying. If I can prove the fundamental theorem of algebra for this polynomial, then it works for this one, which is only a little more and more general, and then it works for the version where z naught is not equal to zero, and I can just put in the complications again. So it gets down to this case, and hopefully this looks familiar. Okay, we know how to solve that problem. All we have to do is make sure that this doesn't screw us up. And the point is that if I'm close to zero, a, just a complex number that's close to zero and take a high power of it, it's going to be very, very small, and in particular it's going to be smaller than this. Okay, so we are almost home free. And that, But now in order to not get mixed up on how to write it, let me scroll down on my cheat sheet. Okay, so what did we want to show? We want to show... Let me rewrite that. So p of z is a plus e to the k plus stuff that's really not going to matter. Okay, and we want to cut a contradiction. We want to show that the magnitude of this guy can be smaller than the magnitude of a. Okay. Um, and that'll be our contradiction because our assumption was that this was that zero was the uh, the place where we got the ma lump, smallest magnitude, and that magnitude is magnitude a. Okay. So, and we're going to do that. And the, the cool thing is, we can do that with z being super small. We'll do it with one hand tied behind our back, with z being very small. And the reason to do that is we're going to have it small enough to ignore the contribution of the OZ to the K plus 1 part. And you can write that out explicitly in inequalities, but it's just a very general thing that, um, yes, if Z is small, this is going to get small, and we're going to use this as our main tool to, to do this and achieve the contradiction, but this is going to be smaller as long as Z is very, very small. Maybe the coefficients in here uh, are, are going to make it, we will have to make z very, very, very small, but we can do that, okay? So if you want to see a little bit more careful written out, look at the Wikipedia article, but we're going to ignore that from now on, okay? So all we need to know is, is there a z 
with the magnitude of a plus c to the k less than the magnitude of a. Absolutely. Let's just look at the geometry of that, the complex number of geometry of that. Okay. So now I'm going to draw a picture of the outputs of the polynomial. Here's a. Okay. Um, it's in some direction from the origin, and I want to find, I want to look at a plus z to the k, and I want to know, can that be made closer to the origin? Well, what does a plus z to the k look like? Okay. If z's, uh, let's say, here's the input, here's where the z's going to live. Um, suppose I have it on going around a small, small circle around the origin. Remember, I have to make it small or else my assertion that I can ignore the higher order terms isn't, isn't true. But it's going to be totally fine. That goes, walks around a small circle around the origin. a plus z to the k is going to walk an even smaller circle around a. But look at that. That's a place that's closer to the origin. Okay? And we just have to figure out why that's true. Well, how do we get it closer to the origin? We just make sure that z to the k is in the opposite direction to a. And we know what that means. Okay? So what we're going to do is first we're going to say let's solve w to the k equals minus a. Honest to God, with full strength, not making it small yet. Okay? And we know that. We know we can solve that. And that's why I did that special case at the start. This is where that comes in. That we can take roots of any complex number, k, k roots of any complex number. Okay? And now let's just let z be some really small real multiplier, traditionally called epsilon times w. And again, that's small enough so that we can ignore the higher order terms, and this is really a good enough analysis. Okay. And then what we get algebraically is that the magnitude of a plus c to the k is a magnitude of a um, times the quantity 1 minus epsilon to the k. Because z to the k is um, epsilon to the k times w to the k, and that w to the k is a. Okay. That's magnitude of a times, well, 1 minus epsilon to the k is just a positive real number. So it factors out of that magnitude. Well, you betcha that's smaller than magnitude a. So that's the algebra. But I think the picture is the key thing, that we've just got it down to this extremely simple polynomial. And all we needed to know is that as we walk the input around the, very close to the, the origin, we get all directions around a. And certainly, some of those are going to be closer. That achieves our contradiction. Let's just, just unravel the logic to, to finish it off. So we've found a smaller value of magnitude p of z than magnitude a. But we were assuming that, that was the smallest one. Okay. So um, our assumption. What was the only assumption we had that wasn't absolutely, but just absolutely true? The assumption was that a was not equal to zero. That magnitude of a was not equal to zero. Is false. And what is? Why is the picture? Why is that crucial? Why is the the um, why does this picture fail in that case? When you're doing a proof by contradiction, you should always make sure. Like, did we really need that thing? Or could we have proved this without the assumption that led to the contradiction? Because otherwise you've either gone horribly wrong or found a basic contradiction in the structure of mathematics, right? Well, this picture is qualitatively wrong if A is zero, <laughs> okay? You can't walk around zero to get closer to zero. That doesn't make any sense. You're already, you're already at zero. The point was, if you're not at zero and you're allowed to walk around that point, you will get closer. So that's why the assumption that a was not equal to zero was the thing that led to this, this idea of, of getting closer. Another way to think about it is kind of more of a practical way, like a sort of a more um, scientist or engineer's way. Suppose we actually wanted to find the minimum of the, the magnitude of p of z, and we have some guess. We're, and so we're not sure that A is really the minimum um, of this, uh, that, that magnitude of A is the minimum 
of all the magnitudes of the values of this polynomial. But let's say, take a guess. How would you make a better guess? How would you improve your guess? Well, this is one strategy. Walk in a little circle around it and see if there's some point where it's smaller. Oh, okay, and then I'll choose that. Okay, now walk a circle around that, walk a circle around that, walk a circle around that, walk a circle around that. So you can always get smaller in a sort of a practical way. When's the only time that's not going to work? It's when you've got the smallest possible value of a magnitude, which is zero. Okay, so that's um, what I wanted to say about the fundamental theorem of algebra. There's lots of other proofs. Some of them take less time, but use more slick theorems. But this is one I like particularly.